Hey everyone, how's it going? Today we're going to be talking about Lightning. Personally, my favorite Lightning is the Metallica album Ride the Lightning. It's got For Whom the Bell Tolls, it's got Fade to Black, I mean, what more could you want? Second place is Lightning McQueen, and third place is the Lockheed P-38 Lightning, an American-made twin boom fighter that saw significant success in World War II in various roles as a fighter, a fighter-bomber, a night fighter, an escort fighter, and effectively as a heavy fighter even though it didn't officially have that designation. The P-38 would go on to have a very strong production run and would be widely used, not only by the United States, but also by the likes of the British, the French, Australia, the Republic of China, Honduras, Colombia, Portugal, Italy, and the Dominican Republic. To put it simply, the P-38 Lightning was a highly successful design and a highly successful combat aircraft. However, just because it was highly successful didn't mean that the U.S. military and Lockheed wouldn't try to improve it. This improvement effort, though, would come about in a rather odd fashion. Instead of just wanting to make a better plane for fighting the enemy, this improvement effort came about because Lockheed just wanted to sell some more P-38s. In 1940, before the United States joined World War II, Lockheed wanted to sell some of their P-38s to the British and French. However, they needed government approval to actually do this, and because the U.S. government had already ordered some P-38s of their own, they didn't want to effectively sell away their military aircraft to the British and French. The U.S. government basically wanted first dibs on those P-38s. Lockheed, though, in the interest of making money, still wanted to sell them overseas, so to get the approval of the U.S. government, a compromise was made. The U.S. government would agree to the sale if Lockheed, largely without government funding, designed, developed, and produced an improved version of the P-38. An agreement was reached in April 1940, and the improved P-38 would go on to be the absolutely massive XP-58 Chain Lightning. Initially, though, the XP-58, then referred to as the L-121, was just a slightly upgraded P-38 with an additional alternate design concept. The first L-121 concept was your standard single-seat P-38, with its standard armament of one 20mm cannon and four 50 caliber machine guns. The difference in it was in the engines. The original P-38 would have two Allison V-1710 engines with around 1,000 horsepower apiece. The improved L-121 designs, on the other hand, would use two Continental 1430 engines, each with around 1,600 horsepower. The second concept of the L-121 would be a bit bulkier than the first. It would be a two-seater with two additional 50 caliber machine guns located in two remote turrets in each tail boom. The next month, in May 1940, it was decided to proceed forward with the twin-seater L-121 design, which would then be given the designation of XP-58. From here until 1944, the XP-58 would undergo a flurry of design changes, improvements, and reversions. To put it simply, the project would be rather chaotic for several years. For example, in July, the Continental engines would be swapped out in favor of the Pratt & Whitney XH2600 with around 1,800 horsepower. This was done because it was feared that the Continental engines would just be too underpowered, and the U.S. government wanted the project to reach a top speed of 450 miles an hour. Two months after that decision, the XP-58's weaponry would also be altered. A second 20mm cannon was added to the nose section, and the twin single turrets in each tail boom was changed to just a single turret at the rear of the fuselage, armed with two 50 caliber machine guns. 
These alterations would have a major impact to the projected top speed, though, due to the added weight. The estimated weight of the original design was around 16,500 pounds gross. With the new engines, the added 20mm cannon, and the turret alteration, the weight grew by almost 50% up to 24,000 pounds, which reduced the projected top speed by 48 miles an hour down to 402. Almost immediately after that, there were even more design changes. That October, Pratt and Whitney canceled the development of the XH2600 engine, which left Lockheed scrambling to find a new one. Lockheed wanted to use the Pratt and Whitney R2800 as a replacement, but the U.S. government stepped in and put forward their own suggestion. The government wanted something more powerful. The R2800 and its roughly 2100 horsepower was more powerful than the XH2600, but the projected top speed of the XP58 with two R2800 engines was only 418 miles an hour, and the government wanted better performance. Instead, they wanted Lockheed to use the Wright XR2160 Tornado engine and its 2,350 horsepower. While this likely wouldn't help the XP-58 reach the initial goal of 450 miles an hour, the Tornado engine was more powerful. However, the Tornado engine was also more finicky and prone to issues. Still, because of the greater power it offered and with the influence of the government, design on the XP-58 proceeded in March 1941 with the Tornado engine. Now, if you thought we were done with the design alterations, then you would be sadly mistaken. We're probably not even halfway there. Two months after the Tornado engine was officially selected, the Air Corps contacted Lockheed and requested that pressurized cabins be added, along with a second turret at the rear of the fuselage, this time located on the underside. Both of these would be at the expense of the government, though. Lockheed would not be on the hook for these changes. With these two additional design changes, the projected weight of the XP-58 ballooned by nearly 50% yet again up to over 34,000 pounds. Still, the positive in all this is that Lockheed could now finally proceed with construction on a set design. For now, at least. Estimated delivery time of the first prototype was now August 1942. Shortly thereafter, though, the delivery time would be horribly delayed because of Pearl Harbor. The problem now was that because of the U.S. being directly involved in World War II, a great deal of military resources were focused on producing large quantities of already proven weaponry and designs. This would severely reduce the number of people working on the XP-58, along with reducing the amount of resources they had available to them. The XP-58 project team would go from a peak of 187 people in October 1941 down to just 12 in early 1942. The team was reduced down to just 6.4% of what they were. Of course, with this severe reduction in project staff, the delivery of the XP-58 was pushed well into the future. Now, even with a reduced staff, this didn't stop the government and military from requesting even more design changes. In March 1942, the Air Force requested from Lockheed a second XP-58 prototype, that included increased fuel storage that would push the range upwards of 3,000 miles. Because the delivery date of the prototypes was already very uncertain, and the tornado engines were being delayed on top of that, Lockheed would agree to this request in May 1942. Seemingly not content with these new design changes, the Air Force requested even more and wanted to change the armament and even the role of the XP-58. 
Instead of having the pair of 20mm cannons in the nose, the Air Force now wanted those cannons swapped out with a single 75mm cannon. However, they quickly realized that for a heavy escort fighter, a 75mm cannon didn't make much sense. The round was just too heavy, and there would be too much bullet drop. So it was decided that the XP-58 would now have a new role as a low-altitude attack plane, a more fitting role for such a large cannon. In this new role, a few different weapon configurations would be considered alongside that 75mm cannon, from having six 20mm cannons to having an internal bomb bay. In having this new role, the new problem now was that there were already two other planes in testing or production in this exact same role that arguably were more well suited for it. The Douglas A-26 Invader was currently in production and would eventually be delivered to the Pacific in September 1943 and would see action in June 1944. This plane was arguably more well-armed than the XP-58, having at maximum up to 20 50 caliber machine guns in various locations, along with the potential to carry rockets and up to 6,000 pounds of explosives. Another plane, the XA-38 Grizzly, was also being tested, but this design would never actually be adopted. Still, though, the Grizzly would have a clear advantage over the XP-58 in that it currently had functioning engines. So, because of the other designs in the attack craft field, the XP-58 would be switched back over to being an escort-slash-heavy fighter. Strangely, though, the Air Force wanted to keep the 75mm cannon for use as a designated bomber-destroyer. They also wanted a second model that had four 37mm cannons in the nose. To this request, Lockheed made the suggestion that just one prototype be made, with an alternate nose section that could be swapped out as needed. One nose would have the 75mm cannon, along with two 50 caliber machine guns, and the other nose would have four 37mm cannons. The Air Force would agree to this in January 1943, but the very next month, the XP-58 would hit yet another roadblock. The oft-delayed and problematic Tornado engine was finally cancelled outright, leaving the XP-58 once again without an engine. The new and final engine selection would be a pair of Allison V-3420 engines, each with around 2,600 horsepower. With the selection of an engine that was actually in existence, production of the XP-58 could truly begin in earnest, and its final design was finally here. And this final design would effectively just be an enlarged P-38, measuring in at 15.07 meters long, 21.34 meters wide, and 4.88 meters tall. The gross weight of the XP-58 ended up being a staggering 39,192 pounds, over twice the original intended size from back in 1940. Despite the Air Force wanting the XP-58 to reach speeds upwards of 450 miles an hour, the true top speed sat just below that at 436, and with a max range of 2,650 miles, that was also below the intended 3,000 mile range. The one and only XP-58 prototype would finally be completed in June 1944, and would fly for the first time on June 6th, D-Day. At this point, though, the flight of the XP-58 was more of a formality than an actual test for a new model to be considered. This design was very low on the priority list with where the war was currently at, and just 25 other flights were conducted with the design. 
I found very little on how well or poorly the design flew, other than the fact that it was having some engine issues. Shocking, I know. After those 25 flights, the plane was moved to Wright Field in Ohio, where it would sit forgotten for an indiscriminate amount of time. The project would be outright cancelled in 1945, and the XP-58 in all likelihood was scrapped, but we do not know for sure. In the end, though, the XP-58 serves as a very clear example of how sometimes government or just higher-up interference can severely hamper design and production. If the Air Corps slash Air Force slash government wasn't so insistent on using the much maligned Tornado engine, it is very likely that a prototype with two R2800 engines would have been made much earlier than June 1944. Plus, if they stopped changing the design and design concept of the XP-58 and just left it as a bigger, slightly stronger P-38, I do think it's very likely that a functional XP-58 not only would have been tested much earlier, but perhaps even accepted, produced, and brought into the war. Probably very late in the war, but into the war nonetheless. Now, for one last little twist, because of how much the government interfered in the project, the XP-58 ended up costing the government quite a lot of money, even though Lockheed was supposed to shoulder the entire cost of the project. The XP-58 ended up costing the government a whopping $2 million, or more accurately, it cost taxpayers $2 million, but, you know, that's semantics for you. And on those semantics, I think we'll go ahead and end for today. So, thank you all for watching. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe. I do wish the XP-58 was actually successful, mainly just because I like the name Chain Lightning. I think it's a cool name for a plane. Plus, in video games and stuff, when you can have a chain lightning ability, it's almost never a bad thing. It's always good. So that pretty much guarantees that the XP-58 would have been a major success. I mean, that's just logic right there. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video, and I hope you learned something. So, see ya!